Hello, and welcome to Module 3 of the Linux Board Porting Online Series. Module 3 is a lecture where we're going to provide an overview of the Linux boot process. The first step in the process of porting Linux to a custom development board is to understand the steps of booting Linux. A minimum of three components are required, the ROM bootloader, U-Boot, and the Linux kernel. In some cases, U-Boot will also require a secondary program loader, or SPL. The ROM bootloader is programmed into the device at production and cannot be changed. For this reason, it has limited functionality and can only be used to load a small program into the internal memory of the device from a fixed set of sources. U-Boot is a software bootloader that contains initialization routines required to boot the Linux kernel. In some cases, U-Boot is too large to fit into the internal memory of the device and will then require a secondary program loader. Here we see the boot process in more detail. We show the device booting from NAND flash. In the first step of the process, the ROM bootloader loads the secondary program loader from NAND flash into the internal memory of the device. In the second step, the SPL loads U-Boot into the external memory of the device, and in the third and final step, U-Boot loads the Linux kernel into external memory. From the standpoint of the board porting effort, the bring up of a new board will require proper hardware configuration in order for this first step of the ROM bootloader to complete successfully. Here we take a closer look at those hardware details. The ROM bootloader stage requires the application of a power source to the device as well as a valid clock-in signal. The RBL will configure the watchdog timer and configure the internal clocking structure to a conservative fixed rate. The internal clocking will be reconfigured to the desired rate by either the SPL or, if there is no SPL, by U-Boot. But at this stage, a clocking configuration is required, and since it is ROM programmed at the factory, a conservative rate must be used. Once the RBL has completed this basic configuration, it will proceed to boot the next program in the chain, which is either an SPL or U-Boot. Again, since the ROM bootloader is programmed at the factory, there are a fixed set of boot options supported at this stage. A few of the peripherals, the UART, USB, and Ethernet port, may be used to boot an image. This functionality is primarily provided for in-circuit programming. Typically in a finished product, the device will be configured to boot from non-volatile memory upon reset. Common block memory types supported are parallel interface NAND and NOR flash devices, I2C interfaced E2 PROM or flash devices, or a multimedia card or secure digital card. Of these, only NOR memory is executed in place. The other memory types will require the ROM bootloader to first copy U-Boot into the internal memory and then execute it. If U-Boot is too large to fit into the internal memory, then a secondary program loader must first be loaded into the internal memory and the SPL will load U-Boot into external memory. The memory or peripheral source from which the ROM bootloader will load the SPL or U-Boot is determined by a special set of pins called the boot mode pins. These pins are sampled at reset. There are four pins, each of which is tied to either a high or low voltage. This allows as many as 16 combinations of boot mode. Some of these boot modes will try only a single source, such as the NAND flash, and if that source does not provide a valid image, will exit with a failure. Many of the boot modes, however, will attempt to boot from as many as four different sources sequentially. For instance, in the diagram shown, the boot mode has been selected to first attempt to boot the U-Boot or SPL from parallel interface NAND flash. But if that boot attempt fails, it will then attempt to boot using the I2C interface, and if that fails, will try an MMC boot and finally a UART boot. Assuming that a NAND boot is selected as the primary boot mode, the ROM bootloader will attempt to load the SPL from a zero offset of the NAND flash. A property of all NAND flash devices is that they are expected to have bit errors over time. For this reason, error code detection and correction is required when using NAND flash to detect these bit errors and, if possible, correct them. If the bit errors within a block become too numerous for correction, this block is marked bad and no longer used. The possibility of bad blocks in the boot section of the NAND flash means that the SPL image could become corrupted. 
In order to counter this possibility, the AM335X ROM bootloader recognizes up to four copies of the SPL. It will begin by attempting to load the first copy at an offset of zero. If the first copy of the SPL resides in a bad block, the ROM bootloader will move to the second, third, and finally the fourth. Additionally, if the header of any of the SPL copies contains an invalid size, which would be either zero or all ones, then the ROM bootloader will move to the next copy in the sequence. Once the SPL has been successfully loaded into the internal memory of the device, it begins executing. The SPL will begin by programming the internal clock tree of the device. Recall that the ROM bootloader also sets default values for the clocking structure, but since the ROM bootloader is factory programmed, its values cannot be changed and are also chosen to be conservative. The SPL is software, so this stage provides an opportunity to specify the clocking to exactly the value desired. The SPL will also configure the pin multiplexer of the device, will configure the UART as a console, and will initialize any peripherals or memory interfaces that it has been configured to support. After this configuration is complete, the SPL will copy U-boot from the NAND flash into the external memory. In the third step, U-boot initializes any interfaces that it requires which were not already configured by the SPL. As we'll see in the next section, the SPL and U-Boot are built simultaneously, so U-Boot is aware of the configuration that has already been performed by the SPL and doesn't waste cycles reconfiguring those interfaces. Finally, U-Boot copies the Linux kernel to the external memory and then transfers control to the kernel to complete the boot process. The Linux kernel will initialize any peripherals whose corresponding driver has been built into the kernel. Any peripherals that were configured by U-Boot will be reconfigured by the kernel if it contains driver support for it. For this reason, both U-Boot and the kernel must be updated if such an external component is changed from the reference design. In summary, there are three bootloaders involved in loading the Linux kernel. The ROM bootloader, the secondary program loader, and U-Boot. The ROM bootloader requires a power source, a valid clock input, and proper selection of the boot mode pins. An SPL is required if U-Boot is too large for the internal memory. The SPL and U-Boot configure only peripherals they have been built to support for the process of loading the Linux kernel. Support for these peripherals must be updated in software if they have been modified from the reference design. This concludes Module 3 of the Linux Board Porting Online Series. Please proceed to the final lecture, Module 4, where we'll be discussing the source code of both U-Boot and Linux.